Well, welcome everyone. My name is Darren Wallentine, and I am the Deputy Fire Chief for the Sarasota County Fire Department, as well as a board member for the International Association of Fire Chiefs Safety, Health and Survival section. I will be today's moderator for the roundtable talk, which is focusing on the safety stand down this year, which is lithium ion batteries. Are you ready? Safety stand down is held the third week in June each year to focus attention and training on critical issues impacting firefighter safety and health. This year's event takes place June 18th through the 24th. And with the name of lithium ion batteries, are you ready? Departments are asked to suspend their non-emergency activities this week to focus on training and education to respond to incidents involving lithium ion batteries. Safety Stand Down is a joint initiative of the International Association of Fire Chiefs, the National Volunteer Fire Council, International Association of Firefighters, the National Fire Protection Association, as well as the Fire Department Safety Officers Association. We are pleased and honored to have panelists from each of these organizations here with us today to talk about this year's theme and how we can be ready for safety stand down. But before we do jump in in today's uh, discussion, I'd like to take a few minutes to let our panelists introduce themselves. And I know that one of our panelists uh, is not yet with us. He's traveling. Hopefully he can jump on with us very soon. But before I get to, uh, to him, let's start off with David Bullard from the National Volunteer Fire Council. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Bullard. I am Georgia State Director for the National Volunteer Fire Council on the Executive Committee for the National Volunteer Fire Council and also on our Health Safety Training and Hazmat Committees. And I'm excited to join today. This is a, uh, a hot topic, of course, for everybody. And I hope as we discuss today, we can kind of get through some of the, uh, the, the clutter that's out there as far as information goes and get some good facts out there and have great discussions with the rest of the panel. Next, we have Jim Barnhart from the Fire Department Safety Officers Association. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, name is Jim Barnhart. I am functioning currently as the Department Safety Officer for Mesa Fire and Medical Department. And that's part of, uh, I guess, a regional, uh, Phoenix, a greater Phoenix metro area suburb of Phoenix. So uh, my fire chief asked me a year ago to become a lithium ion subject matter expert. and. Uh, much like all of us, we hit the ground running with a emerging threat that is uh, impacting us on every level in our uh, respective jurisdictions. So we've come up with some good uh, best practices, policies and procedures for us uh, here locally and look forward to sharing and providing input or guidance that I can. Appreciate y'all. Thank you, Jim. Next on our list is Sean DeCrane from the International Association of Firefighters, but apparently he's somewhere in the uh, Denver airport trying to find a place where he can jump onto this call. And if he does, uh, we'll get him into the discussion as well. But next we have from the International Association of Fire Chiefs, uh, Chief Michael O'Brien. Hey, thanks, Darren. And uh, thank you for your continued leadership. Super excited about this week's safety or this year's safety stand down. Um, what an opportunity for us as an organization just to collectively come together and put a great focus um, on our officers and our firefighters responding to these events, and they're happening daily across the United States. So um, big thanks to the International Association of Fire Chiefs. I, I serve on their board of directors as well as chair their battery committee, um, and, and I serve as the fire chief here in Brighton, Michigan, which is quickly becoming... Um, you know, the state of Michigan is quickly becoming the battery capital of the world. And so we, we know this is a big lift, but what an exciting time it is for us as leaders in the fire service set to collectively come together and put our focus towards really preparing our firefighters to be safe uh, and being capable of responding. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Chief. Really appreciate you being here. 
And then last, but certainly not least, we have Brian O'Connor from NFPA. Hey everyone, good afternoon. My name is Brian O'Connor. I'm a fire protection engineer in the technical services department of NFPA. I've been working with lithium ion batteries for the past couple of years and was staff liaison to NFPA 855, the standard for the installation of stationary energy storage systems. Very excited to work on this topic. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, Brian. And thanks to everybody who's, uh, who's all here today. So just a little bit about today's format. Today's discussion will last about an hour, depending on how many questions we receive from those who are in attendance. I have some prepared questions in front of me that uh, will help direct our discussion, but we're also gonna be taking questions from you, our attendees. Um, so if you do send your questions through the chat, we have Maggie, who is uh, our giant safety net, who is gonna keep us on track and, and then feed me the questions that might come from you, our attenders. So uh, with that, let's get started. All right, so for today, the, the theme of the safety stand down for 2023 is lithium ion batteries, are you ready? So question for all of our panelists and we'll go one at a time and I'll call on you as we go. Why is this theme, why was this theme chosen and why is it important that responders are trained on lithium ion battery response? And I'll start off the discussion first with uh, Brian from NFPA. Perfect. All right. Um, yeah. So lithium ion batteries, I just to say they're dangerous would be, you know, not making them unique enough, right? Because fires, all fires are dangerous, but lithium ion batteries pose such a unique hazard that we're just not used to addressing. They are just something that we have to alter our tactics to alter our thinking. Uh, it's something that if we go and try to fight the fire the same way we've always been doing it, then we're risking firefighters' lives, safety. Um, so this is something that we have to think more about, educate more people, educate the public, educate the fire service. Um, and we're, we're competing with trying to get information out there, right? There's information everywhere. So trying to get the right information, make sure it's going to the right hands is, is something that's essential. And I think that's how we land on this topic. All right, well, thank you, Brian. And as uh, looks like Sean is uh, able to join us, so so welcome, Sean. Um, can you uh, can you hear me? Looks like he's still connecting. We'll give him a moment here to get up uh, onto the onto the uh, discussion. So let's move to uh, Chief O'Brien. Let's uh, why why was this theme chosen and why is it important for responders <coughs> to be trained on lithium ion battery response? Yeah, I can't, I can't tell you how many fire departments and fire chiefs I've spoken to that have a, have a great plan. Like Jim said, hey, look, a year and a half ago, my chief came to me and said, get into this topic. And right now we, we've got those departments that are doing that. And then we have a lot of departments that are like, this isn't, this isn't our issue. And so a big portion of, of why I love this topic is it's bringing it to the forefront for all of us as, as fire service professionals to say, hey, look, this is here. It's in all of our backyards. It's in all of our homes. It's in all of our garages. It's not a California thing. It's not just a New York City thing. It's everybody. And so um, really, I truly think that this, how we handle these incidents is very important for the safety of our firefighters, but then it's also very important for our communities because it's not just about putting the fire out and walking away anymore. We have a lot of effort now that we have to do that goes beyond initial suppression tactics of whether it's a, a fire that was started from an electrified piece of equipment all the way to an EV response. And so it's a great opportunity for us to collectively come together as a fire organization um, and, really, and really try to work our plans back home. And, and I think your people are gonna find that we have got some great ideas planned this week where they can start with very simple things just to get the ball rolling in their community. They don't have to be a battery expert to find success this week. So it's just a great, great chance to try to right size the whole fire service. Thank you, Chief. So uh, from the volunteer side, David, what, uh, why is this theme so important for our first responders, uh, especially our volunteer responders with lithium ion 
uh, batteries. Hey, David, I think you're still muted. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, no community, no department type is, is immune from the hazards that come with these. And, and as I said earlier, it's a unique challenge and there's a lot of fear mongering that's going on out there. And then also, you know, the departments are saying this isn't our problem. Everybody is going to face something at some point in time involving a battery, whether it's a garage fire, a fire in a shed, a fire in a shop, a, a piece of uh, mobility equipment, something like that. And to be prepared and understand what's going on with them, have good information, how to deal with it. Um, I've even had local governments uh, contact me in my state, not wanting to put charging stations in their community because the fire chief had told them, oh, EV fires are difficult to put out. We don't want them here. And I'm like, well, this isn't field of dreams. If you put the charging stations in, that doesn't make the vehicles come. They're going to pass through anyway. Let's stop fear monitoring to understand some tactics and, and what to do here. Well, thank you for that. And then Jim uh, from the Fire Department Safety Officer Association, as a safety officer, uh, why is this theme so important this year? You know, Chief, it gives us uh, gives us a foundation to build on, right? We're really talking about what what our company officers kept asking is, what do I do next, right? We recognize the hazards, but how am I going to handle it? How am I going to handle this problem before uh, before a hazardous materials technician gets there, before my chief officers or my safety officers? Um, I think it's important for us to be, be able to kind of get out of that fast attack mode, right? To slow down and recognize the environments that we're gonna be working in, recognize the hazards that uh, the lithium ion fires can create, whether it's explosive nature or whether it's the toxicity or the electric electrocution hazards that they pose for us. But really it's fun for, uh, my biggest takeaway is let's slow down and understand what we're dealing with and then come up with the appropriate plan to best take care of our customers' needs. And if we slow down, it increases our margin of safety on the operations and the suppression side immensely. <clears throat> well said, Jim, thank you very much. And uh, Sean, glad, uh, so glad that you could join us. Um, in addition to, to, de to describing the theme of uh, why it's important that we uh, train on this lithium ion battery response, why don't you give us a brief introduction for yourself from the International Association of Firefighters? and then uh, why it's important for this topic to be discussed. Sure, thanks, Chief. I'm sorry, we need, I'm in a United Club in Denver on my way out to Santa Fe, ironically for Sandia's National Lab, is hosting a uh, ESS safety conference. So I'm gonna be speaking from the fire service perspective exactly about this point. Uh, my name is Shonda Crane, currently the director of the IFF Health and Safety Operational Services. I'm trying not to be the loud talker in the United Club. There are like a hundred other loud talkers here. But um, I, I spent my career in Cleveland, Ohio, and I went to UL for six years prior to uh, coming back home to the IFF. Uh, also, I've been a member of the advisory board for the UL Fire Safety Research Institute since our inception. But this is the critically important. I listened to Chief O'Brien and, and uh, and Bearman and Brian talk and, and Dave's comments, um, this could, is gonna hit all facets of the fire service, whether you're in prevention and inspection, whether you're in investigation, whether you're in suppression, you're going to have to deal with this new technology that's coming into the marketplace. Just the economic and environmental forces that are driving the switch to the lithium ion batteries, they're, they're significant. And so one, I absolutely agree, we need to be involved in, understanding what we're responding to, understanding how we can apply the correct codes and standards to mitigate a failure, but also understand how to respond to a failure when it occurs. We can't be afraid of it. We can respect it and understand it and start to develop tactics that are appropriate for that situation. Well, thank you, Sean. Uh, it's very important. I mean, everything that you've mentioned, you know, is, is kind of what's going to lead this uh, discussion today and hopefully bring value back to those who are attending. Um, and then at some point, you know, for others who couldn't get on today, they can still get on and get this information um, so that they can uh, be better prepared 
not only through this webinar, but also with the safety stand down this year. So thank you for joining us. So as we start uh, some of these uh, foundational questions, let's, let's start with Brian. Where are lithium ion batteries found? Yeah, so great question. Um, you know, as many of the other panelists already mentioned, this is coming to a town near you if it isn't already there. And that's because lithium ion batteries are all around us. They've infiltrated society and for good reason. They're needed for a lot of different applications. And the, the, the crux of the problem with lithium ion batteries is that they do their job really well. They store a lot of energy in a really small footprint, which is great for being a battery. But when you release that energy in an uncontrolled manner, it causes all sorts of chaos that we'll start talking about after here. But they're found in a ton of applications and we can kind of bucket them into different sizes, but recognizing the hazard of lithium ion batteries and where they're found is the very first step in trying to address this, this question. So they're found in, of course, our consumer electronics. Everyone has a cell phone that has a lithium ion battery in it. They're in your watches, your tablets, your power tools. And I'm gonna categorize this as kind of a, the smaller bucket of lithium ion batteries, um, but there can be many of them and, and they add up once uh, you start collecting a lot of power tools in your basement or something like that. Um, and the challenge with them is that they're very small, so they can be found virtually anywhere, right? You can hide a cell phone in between cushions of the couch, um, you know, under a plane seat, you know, they can be found in all these sorts of places that you wouldn't expect or someone lost them there. Um, one step up from these small, we'll go like the medium size, we will, and we'll talk about this later, are micro mobility devices, which is an overarching term that we're going to use for electric bicycles, electric scooters, those, you know, those fleets of scooters you might see in big cities, uh, rentable bikes and rentable scooters. Um, there's also uh, electric wheelchairs. And this kind of, you know, fits that medium size battery where it's big enough to cause a, a very significant fire, but still small enough where they can be found almost virtually anywhere too. They can be hidden in the trunk of a car, in someone's closet. Um, they can be in a lot of different locations that, that might be unpredictable, um, which, you know, kind of raises that level of hazard there. Getting a little bit bigger, we're getting to electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are typically only found in parking spaces, parking garages, and the roads. So they're kind of limited on where we're going to find them, which is good. So we can do a little bit more planning. But of course, they go a lot faster. They're filled with people. You know, lives are, are, could be in danger. Um, crashes happen. It's just part of life. Um, so we are going to be experiencing fires in, in these larger electric vehicles. And you're going to have to be able to recognize that it's not a regular you know, gas powered vehicle, it, it's, it's an electric vehicle so that you can respond differently. And so, you know, being able to visually identify them and figure out that we do have different tactics uh, for responding to what we call internal combustion engine, your gas and diesel versus your electrics. Um, and then when we get actually about the same size of electric vehicles, you have your residential energy storage systems. And this is just a big battery bank that you're going to have either on the outside of your house, in your shed, in your garage. And these are still very significant battery loads and fire loads, but they're going to be stationary. So you, for the most part, should know or should know where to look for them. Uh, they, they will be a little bit less hidden, hopefully, and a little bit more engineered and designed around. And then once you get past those residential energy storage systems, we get to those huge scale, which are your, your commercial and utility scale energy storage system, which might be a full room filled with batteries or a full building just filled to the room with batteries and, and electrical components. Um, then we start having very significant fires and fire challenges in those types of ecosystems that we'll see. Um, but that's kind of the scale of lithium ion batteries that we'll see. Um, but of course, there are different technologies that that blend those those buckets. I kind of put them in. So, yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> so I think that this just continues to pose the the challenge for our fire service professionals is that with you will find them everywhere and you're likely to encounter them on just about every incident that you respond to you know whether they are intact or whether they are you know uh, being you know um, damaged and then creating additional problems so let's start talking about uh, the hazards and david i'm going to throw this one to you so what are some of the unique hazards that we that we encounter with lithium ion batteries that are different from other fires? 
Well, first of all, the obvious and everything that is on social media out there in articles is the difference in electric vehicles and uh, the amount of water needed, the tactics, trying to get water to the battery department and cool. Planning, you know, a normal vehicle fire, we can handle it on tank water. If you're looking at three to 8,000 gallons to your initial planning standpoint, upwards from there, can you support this off of a hydrant? There's no hydrant. Do you have a water supply for this? Um, do you need mutual aid for that water supply? How long can you sustain it? Um, I was doing a class in Washington State a couple weeks ago, and there was a, a firefighter there from a coastal community that mentioned the fact that anything goes to their storm drains is likely to wind up in the ocean. They have to make a decision pretty quickly. Are they going to fight something or let it burn if they can't control runoff? And getting into the higher amounts of flows like that is very much a deterrent for them from probably doing anything unless they have an exposure problem. Um, but even changing the way we look at, at overhaul or even a, a small fire in a garage, a small fire in a kitchen where batteries could have been involved um, to checking around to make sure we haven't lost battery cells into couches or cushions or, or under things and just rethinking our approach to a number of different incidents because of that. Well, thank you, David. So Jim, what are some of the what are a few of the operational considerations that we should take into consideration when responding to electric vehicle fires? Yes, sir. <clears throat> if we, uh, upon recognition, right, whether that's done through a company officer on basic size up, or if that's something that could be indicated by the responsible party that's uh, activated emergency services, um, well, as soon as we can recognize it, we start to understand what, what are the issues that can hurt us. So. Um, we account for the toxic nature of the off-gassing. So whether it's in the beginning of an event or late into an event, especially something like an electric vehicle fire, um, post-extinguishment, most firefighters see steam as generally a good sign. But in an electric vehicle environment, that might be a toxic off-gassing that's more of a predictor of what's going to happen next. And that brings us to secondary fires. Right, A secondary fire or a rekindle in the fire service is not something any of us ever want to be a part of, but due to stranded energy, the amount of energy still in a battery, whether it's mechanical damaged or thermally damaged, um, that creates the environment for that secondary fire. Uh, that also stranded energy brings in the electrocution hazards, right? Whether it's an EV that has due to just sheer forces of nature from the, the rate of speed of the collision, the battery system might have suffered mechanical damages that it can ground out to the frame of the vehicle. So though it might not currently be burning or might be moving towards that thermal event, uh, it could create that uh, electrocution hazard as we start to intimately interact with the vehicle. Um, if we account for the off-gassing, we account for the stranded energy that brings us that secondary fire hazard. Um, it also uh, can create an explosive environment, right? So uh, ventilation limited electric vehicle fire could build up to a point that inside the passenger compartment could be uh, an explosive environment. So we have to take great caution. Um, we look at and here from Mesa, Arizona, obviously solar is a big, big, big deal in Arizona. Um, we don't install a PV array on a residential anymore that doesn't have some sort of battery storage with it. So we're starting to look at where our crews, uh, whether it's an on-deck company or a rescue or a RIT team, a lot of times are parked into the, uh, placed into the front side or the street side of the occupancy. We're looking at garages a little bit different now because it might be an EV fire or a battery charging station inside that garage that's creating that explosive environment where a lot of times it's us, we're the exposures out in the front yard, whether it's our pump operators, you know, our firefighters that are taking supply lines or pulling hose lines, they're kind of in that hazard zone uh, due to explosive environment. So <clears throat> those are the big ones that we're, we're trying to focus our efforts on for sure. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you, Jim. So the next question, uh, I don't think we can scroll through social media without seeing some video of a mobility device that erupts that uh, almost looks like a rocket when it uh, ignites. So first, uh, Sean, uh, would you uh, please uh, give us some of a few of the operational considerations when responding to a micro mobility device? involving yeah. batteries, and then following that, uh, Chief O'Brien, um, 
I'll get, uh, if you want to fill in any additional information following Sean. So just, just so you know, you went beauty before you went with Mike, right? So, um, cause he's the most handsome guy in the fire service, but, uh, just, to, I want to regress just a little bit talking about some particular hazards with the lithium ion devices. And I don't want us to go down a path. That this is all just electric vehicles. <clears throat> As you're mentioning here with these micro mobility devices, uh, we have significant challenges. Uh, one, we see the rapid fire spread. I was recently asked by someone in the media, what's the biggest difference between these micro mobility devices and say a uh, space heater fire or yeah. a cooking fire? And it's, it's the rate of fire growth. We can see, and that's one of the challenges is the inconsistency of ignition because these batteries not only emit uh, a gash, uh, I should say a flammable explosive gas, but they also become their own ignition source. So we don't have a reliability to know when that ignition source is going to occur. But we can go from just a battery sitting like it's okay to instant flashover with the ignition of those gases. So I think that's a significant challenge and the explosive, the pressure wave that's created by that ignition. So I think a big challenge that our members have when responding to these incidents, especially with micro mobility is we don't have a reliable way to know when this incident is over. Especially if we look at high rise, the higher up in the buildings, when these batteries have been mechanically damaged or thermally damaged, they are unstable. We do not have a reliable way to indicate that they've reached stability or that they have no stranded energy involved. Our thermal imager cameras can be a clue, but that is giving us the temperature of the outer casing. It's not giving us any kind of indication on the stability of the interior of the battery. And then also, how do we mitigate this? We know there are firefighters that are bringing, putting them in bathtubs for a period of time and submersing them. We've seen products come to the market that want to be utilized or market themselves as the answer for the lithium ion battery, but we don't have a lot of research to determine that that's a reliable methodology. We don't have a standard right now that says, this piece of equipment that I'm gonna to use to put the battery in is going to safely contain that ignition or that deflagration should that battery fail as our members are pulling it out of a building. Uh, we've seen some success, but is it reliable? Are we getting lucky or is it, or is it the answer? Uh, I'm happy that UL is actually putting together a standard right now, UL 1487. At uh, the debate, we just had our first meeting the other day. We're debating how is this going to apply? Is it just to battery cabinets that are stationary in a building? Is it going to apply to port cabinets? So ones that we would utilize in removing a battery, say from a high rise or from a residence or from a business that uh, we can safely deploy knowing that our members are intimate with that device. If an ignition or deflagration occurs, will they be safe? So I think we see a lot of research that's going on. We're starting to get that information. And we see some of the answers coming our way. We're just not there yet. And I think that's the significant challenge that we have. But as a fire service, we have to stay engaged and we have to continue to push industry to do the research, to do the testing, to give us the answer. And I'll give, the, I, uh, give my time to Mike O'Brien. You know, and I, Sean, I, I, we cannot overlook what we're seeing with the speed of these incidents, specifically when indoors. And so, you know, Darren, you had asked about the mobility space. And what I would tell you is, is it ironic that we probably will say an EV, an energy storage system that's installed per today's code is a much different incident for us to handle than unregulated devices. And so, right, our car manufacturers across the United States are doing wonderful things to really make that vehicle safe, right? They're working on limiting water intrusion. They're working on making the better cell. We're seeing just rapid changes um, in chemistries across the United States and abroad. We're seeing a lot in that space, but this mobility market um, is, is creating just devastating fires that are fatal. Um, never before, right? We've said fires fast, right? We've been saying that fires fast. But when we start to look at some of these tests and we're seeing deflagrations and flashover in sub 30 seconds from the time of visible smoke, somebody asked the question, well, how do we know if the batteries or, or batteries involved, right? Um, 
typically in many of these cases, it's what's presenting and what are we seeing? So if we, if, if anybody Googles UL FSRI scooter bike, right, they're going to find the video where you all purposely overcharge a mobility device. And this was, this was intended to replicate something that's been happening in many of our communities. And so what we're seeing is when we get this stored energy and they're not those quality cells that we're talking about that we're seeing in energy storage and other places that we can get this very rapid fire event in a location that was not designed. And so this challenge for us um, is big. And so, you know, we've got a lot of education as the fire service to do, not only for our company officers to say, hey, look, recognize that a battery pack was involved. And before we go aggressive overhaul, it's one thing if we've got an active, very heavy fire up in an attic and we've got to open it up. But if we have a minute to get a device outside or if it's in the high rise, we should have a different policy. But for most of us, it's probably two, three story homes. Getting it outside is part one. It's does our fire department have a strategy in identifying all the cells, all the misplaced stuff? Because when we don't do our due diligence, like Jim said, slowing down, that's where we have second events. And none of us have the time and energy of the staff to keep going back to the same place. Like this is, this can be the rekindle that doesn't go away. And it may not just be tomorrow, but it's going to be weeks at times. And so what we do, not only in the initial response to extinguish the fire is important, what we do post event and getting it outside the structure and then getting it finally to recycling, whatever that solution is in our community. But this is changing some of our public messaging as well. And I think NFPA has done some good stuff. IFC's pushed some stuff. We've all been trying to say, hey, we've got some new stuff, right charger for the right piece of equipment, the right battery for the right piece of equipment. Don't charge at your front door, but right, you got this big, cool bike with dirty tires. You don't want to wheel it all over your carpet. And so Sean was starting to talk about the need for charging facilities within some of our multifamily residential buildings. And so we've got this changing demographic that we as the fire service have got to drive the conversation. Um, I love that uh, David was talking about vehicle chargers because one of the things that I keep thinking of, fire chiefs have to be advocating for community charging. I want you to think about that for a second. We have to be advocating because if we don't get good quality charging in for our, our EV fleet, they're going to figure out other places to charge and that's going to create a secondary events we don't want. And so more now than ever, as firefighters, as fire chiefs, and everybody in between, we have a big job to do to not only prepare for that initial level response, recognizing those hazards, but making sure that we're working really hard to prevent these things from occurring. But our actions are going to dictate whether or not we go back a second time. I don't care if your mobility device, if we don't get it out of that building, there's a high likelihood we're going back on a rekindle. If we don't tow an EV after an incident, right, there's a high likelihood it's going to cause a secondary event. And so we just have this big job ahead of us where we got to keep asking questions. We got to keep listening. We got to keep finding partners in, in learning from each other. So we hopefully reduce that impact over time. Thank you, Chief. You know, um, I think it's been my understanding that the more questions that we ask, we, we then find out there's a whole lot more we just don't know. Um, so this is one of those uh, opportunities for us to, to try to, you know, do our very best to get ahead of it. But oftentimes the technology is advancing so much more quick than we can actually keep up with it. So, so the last part, and I know that we were gonna spend most of our time discussing the operational considerations because that's usually the, 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 the direction that most of our fire service professionals want to know. What do I do if? So the last one of the operational consideration questions is regarding fires involving energy storage systems. And so I'm gonna throw this back to Jim for you to maybe touch on some of the, the additional information that we haven't yet touched on uh, in some of the other topics. Thank you, Chief. Um, specific with battery energy storage, um, or once upon a time, I thought it was building energy storage, right? Uh, these large, uh, uh, I guess, almost shipping container connex boxes or to even standalone commercial buildings where the entire square footage of it becomes essentially one large battery. Um, most people are aware of the uh, deflagration or explosive, explosion event we had in our West Valley uh, involving Surprise Fire Department and Peoria Fire Department. Um, 
we formulated a policy based on that. That was a big unknown, battery energy storage. And so we create a policy of how to deal with that. And what we learned was a lot of the, they, they started re-engineering these battery uh, energy storage systems to take some of the, uh, take the building away from the equation. So it doesn't give us that explosive environment that we have to go into, whether it's life safety or property conservation. But as they started to re-engineer a lot of these battery energy storage, um, they would put in things like deflagration panels, right? They put in ventilation systems, fire suppression systems, uh, all ways to make it a safer environment to limit our exposure when we have to intimately interact in those environments. Um, we had a secondary fire uh, just this last year in Chandler, Arizona. It was a, a, a APS, uh, building energy storage or battery energy storage. We exercised our SOP. We moved very slowly. Um, we, that thing burned for 10 days. Uh, I think a little bit, a little bit longer than that until we completely wrapped up that scene. But we exercised a policy and we kept everybody safe and we limited everybody's, uh, I guess, exposure. Um, we had to get very creative. Uh, it involved SWAT teams and involved bomb technicians that were operating drones. Uh, we had to get a like a machine shop to fabricate something to hold the key so we could use a robot to open up that building where we didn't put a firefighter in danger uh, of an explosion. So <clears throat> we exercised that policy on that event and it went very well. Um, I like to always point out, I know everybody here is aware of it, but to our audience out there, the problem's relatively consistent, whether it's a Milwaukee battery for a, a drill or whether it's an electric vehicle or a building energy or battery energy storage system, but the size and scope of the fire problem changes, right? How big the fire is, how much it off gases, how much of an electrocution potential it has for us. So anything dealing with energy storage right? We're by design, we're storing energy, it's going to hold a lot, right? There's a lot of electricity inside very small environments. Um, we are fortunate, or sometimes unfortunate, a lot of our residential batteries are going on the exterior of homes. Now, I find that, I mean, the west wall of a house in Arizona, uh, in August is about 150 degrees out. <laughs> And that's now where we're bolting a Generac or a Tesla battery wall to it. So on one hand, I think long term, that's going to pose its own unique hazards as those start to degrade from the uh, thermal insult they take from the sun every single day. But they're also not being put inside the garages. They're not put, being put inside the occupancy types. So that certainly helps us a little bit. But I think it's the a lot of times, I know every, every, every jurisdiction could be a little bit differently, but a lot of times our, our engineers or our driver operators are the ones that go to the utility locations to secure power to the building. Now we're asking our captains to make that part of their initial size up, their 360, because that might be the only telltale that lets them know that they are going into an environment. It doesn't have necessarily have to be involved at that time, but they are going into an environment that has an ESS system inside that occupancy. So... The recognition has become key for us so we can better adapt our incident action plans. <clears throat> and Darren, if I could sneak in, Jim, one of the things we're now seeing that I've gotten a couple here is homemade systems as well, right? So when we have Tesla and LG or, or somebody that's got a listed product meets NFPA 55, our, our, we're trying to get our folks to even identify that, hey, that's a homemade system. And so um, it's just something to kind of throw out there that who would have ever thought that people would be buying like LG cells and putting them in their home and making their own energy storage. All this work that like Jim talked about, about, you know, some of these major manufacturers trying to make really, really good systems that meet the testing and meet the requirements. And now we get homemade, right? We've seen it in the mobility, homemade ESS, it just adds another layer. Yes, sir. We know we had a very complicated, it was a relatively large fire, but a gentleman, he lived right in the middle of a city, right? We're not, we're not off the grid. We have Wi-Fi, we have utility services, but he, living in the city, wanted to be off the grid. He ordered decommissioned electric vehicle batteries. They were 600 pounds each, modules from South Korea. So these were already damaged and def defective batteries when he imports them. And he wants to non-permit it. He wants to live off the grid. So we extinguished the batteries. We used a third-party hazmat cleanup. At the time, 
it was uh, we favored putting them submerging them in water. So we got a watertight roll off dumpster, a 40 yard dumpster, and we dumped these 600 pound batteries with forklifts in them. 60 days later, we had a secondary fire when he drained that that water containment and loaded the batteries on a trailer and was driving down a major, major city thoroughfare when they re, re, reignited in, the, in transit on the freeway. So to your point of non-permitted, everything's, uh, it, it's all on the table for us. So for sure. All right, Sean, did I see your hand up? Did you have a, a comment? Uh, I, yeah, I, I wanna be respectful of time. I just, I had a couple of thoughts and, you know, Jim, you talk about non-permitted and, you know, we're, we're, we're working that, you know, the city of New York mayor just passed a law stating you have to be a certified product coming into market. And that's great, but it just lacks the teeth of enforcement. We have to identify how are you going to enforce these, these steps to require certified listed products coming into the market. That's one. Uh, we are conducting research and I don't know, maybe I'm getting ahead of the question, but developing some visual indicators that the battery's involved. And the IFF UL Solutions and FSRI just did a project for the Department of Energy looking specifically at residential energy storage systems in a garage. And this is a challenge. We can see when a battery initially fails, we see that multi-stratification, the, the heavier vapors load to the ground, the lighter gases. But when we start involving secondary combustibles, um, those are gone because of the buoyancy, the heat creates the buoyancy, we lose that visual indicator. Uh, also weather, and a lot plays into this. So uh, maybe uh, again, I'm ahead of myself here, but we are developing some educational projects off of that. I know NFPA, Andrew Clock, we're working with Andrew given him the information from heart testing so that they can start to push it out. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I jumped in too, too early there. Thank you. No, no worries, Sean. You're, uh, you're kind of reading off the questions. Uh, I think that as I'm getting ready to, to put Brian on the hot seat, um, when we talk about NFPA and our standards, you know, there's, there's also at the department level, um, every department, at some point, you're going to be dealing with this type of event. Of an event. Uh, so, as far as key topics that we should address when it regards our SOGs or our SOPs, um, what are some of the key takeaways for relating that back to firefighter safety and how we approach these incidents? Yeah, absolutely. So, for some of these bigger systems, we of course want to see the pre-planning done. We want to make sure that they have their emergency operations procedures you know, pre-thought out, pre-coordinated with the local fire department. Um, but again, with these smaller systems that are more mobile, that's not always going to happen. Um, so ultimately, when overhauling, responding to these incidents, and after the incident, you have to worry about shock hazards still. Like you mentioned, we have electrical potential energy in these battery cells, and you could always short circuit one, you could shock yourself. So um, being aware, being careful, using non-conductive materials when performing overhaul, that's, you know, maybe a wooden shovel, maybe uh, some, some hardened plastic materials. Uh, again, just trying to be aware that if you do disturb some of these batteries that have failed, they can create the shock hazard, but then they also have a reignition hazard too, which is the second part. So understanding that there's a reignition hazard. So always donning your PPE or um, SCBA and your PPE, of course. Uh, because they do off-gas toxic and flammable gases. You don't want to breathe any of that in. Um, so making sure that you're aware that if batteries were involved, that a reignition hazard is still possible while conducting overhaul. Um, and then ultimately, we want to figure out what to do with them after the fire, right? How do we dispose of them? How do we recycle them? So ultimately, you should reach out to local waste or uh, recycling facilities, uh, do some pre-planning, maybe a third party hazardous material company needs to be involved, um, but trying to figure this out on the scene is gonna be a lot harder than doing some pre-planning ahead of time, making sure that we do have a plan. Um, Overpacking, which is again, filling them in these giant tubs of this vermiculite material, this really a, a heat absorbing material, or submerging them in water have been successful in the past, but it really depends on the extent of damage to each battery, what you wanna do with them. Um, because again, sometimes adding water can make some healthy batteries go bad. Uh, and the other thing would be 
decontamination of all of your uh, firefighter PPE as well as firefighter and gear that's associated. Um, just like any other fire, we make sure that's done just to uh, prevent uh, toxins. So that just uh, illuminates the uh, the need for us uh, as uh, firefighters is to and fire service leaders is to have those SOPs in place that will help guide our operations. So, David, uh, is there any special gear or equipment that we will need when we respond to these types of uh, incidents? Um, let's say you. Well, I think from the firefighting standpoint, it's going to be structural gear and an overhaul. You may want to consider if you think there's a large presence of HF or something there, you may want to overhaul wearing a a neoprene glove or something appropriate for the HF, I would definitely recommend um, chloride paper for testing an environment in closed area if you're looking for hits on that. And uh, I also want to kind of touch back that uh, previously mentioned uh, disposal of batteries. Uh, go ahead and predetermine out who's going to pay for that too. The, the, the department doesn't need to be, you know, holding the checkbook on that if there's a way that you can do cost recovery or whatever. And the same with your PPE. Any PPE that becomes disposable from this can you do this like many departments do on a hazmat and make this a cost recoverable item as well as even if you've had to do advanced cleaning on gear or equipment, is that part of that as well? Excellent. Well, I think that that kind of uh, answered probably the next question that I had when, in regards to, you know, not only uh, some of you have already mentioned uh, disposal of these uh, these batteries, and uh, now have touched on the, the decon. Um, any one of you um, for the decon? Is this a decon that we're going to uh, perform just like we do, as uh, like a per the preliminary exposure reduction that we we find in NFPA as far as uh, post fire washdown, or is this you more unique towards like a, a hazardous materials response? So I'll jump in real quick. Um, when, so that's a big question. Right? We're, we, we've had that question a lot. You know, is a residential fire involving an ESS more hazardous than a regular residential fire? Well, we aren't measuring the runoff from a resi resi residential fire currently. Um, same the, the same question with the EV, the fuel injected vehicle versus the EV vehicle. EV vehicle, is it more hazardous? Uh, we've only seen some research done by RISE over in Sweden. And currently the research that RISE has presented, uh, you're trading one hazard for another as it relates to the run. But there are two projects coming up. One NFPA, it, the Fire Research Foundation has funded a project that's gonna be looking at electric vehicle fires. And UL's Fire Safety Research Institute is kicking off a multi-year, it's I think it's 1.4 million a year looking into the EVs. And we're going to be trying to answer those questions, right? What is the hazard of the runoff? Do we need to contain it? Is it more hazardous to let it burn? Or is it more hazardous to, to suppress to the environment, to the firefighters? What happens to the PPE? Can we clean the PPE? We've seen some reports back that They've tried to clean the PPE or the blanket with multiple washes and they still have that battery ordered to them. But we want to try to give some definitive answers right now. Yes, immediately decon when you respond to a fire involving a battery. Uh, take your PPE out of service, start to cleanse it, uh, verify that it's clean through the certification. But uh, those are those are questions we don't have absolute answers to yet, but we're working on them with multiple projects. Well, thank you, Sean. So as we begin to wind down, we've got just a couple more questions. Um, and then I want to see if we have time to get to some of the questions that are coming in on the chat. So as we start to wind this down, uh, Chief O'Brien, uh, public education is also a critical component in all of this. So what are some of the messages that departments should be communicating to the public to help prevent these lithium ion battery uh, fires and emergencies in the first place. Yeah, if we start with the buckets like uh, Brian kind of laid out, mobility, home electronics, right? The right battery, the right charger, um, you know, the location where we're storing, right? So we can start there and, and we really have to change our messaging, right? We're still talking about working smoke alarms in the home setting. 
we're still talking about where we charge, how we charge. Now we just got to morph that a little bit. Um, you know, and I want people to think about from a, a public education standpoint, one of the things is how do we stop these events? Well, if trash fires are on the rise and the suspect is, it's because inappropriate disposable batteries. Can you as a leader solve this question that somebody comes up to you and says, hey, this battery pack is hot and swollen, right? Most people, including the fire service, don't know how to answer that question to properly dispose of that. So as in the public education realm, Chief, it's really us starting to build these messages from what we know. FDNY Smart, NFPA have great resources, e-bikes, mobility, lithium ion, general safety. Get those downloads and start building those and start discussing that. Number two, start looking at more community solutions in how we start to address suspect batteries, battery issues, and are there partnerships? Every Home Depot, every Lowe's, every other big box collects batteries and are inspectors doing what we're supposed to be doing uh, in that environment. And so there's a lot of education we can be doing, right? The right charge in charging and electrified vehicles, we've got a lot of statements and a lot of work we have to do there. Um, so I would just really encourage people, dive into these resources and start building tools, find opportunities. You know, City of Toronto through the IFC gave us a bunch of pre-planned uh, public education. So if you head over to IFC's webpage, which I think is going to be linked on our safety stand down or it is, just click that. You can get to all these great resources and, and share them out with your public because we have a huge opportunity here to really help shape this. These are these mobility fires are deadly. They're, they're too high of a leading cause in the United States right now. And we've really got to keep pushing. And, and I would argue that the last bit is buying the right piece of equipment from the start, something with some kind of listening and testing and right product so we can keep educating our public. I had a great conversation with a homeowner mom the other day. And she said, yeah, my kid's building all these battery packs for his RC cars. It's great. We just go pick up the batteries. And so we had to have a conversation about charging, right? When can you charge? When should you charge? Only charge when you're home. And so it's a dialogue that we've all got to keep looking at and uh, keep exploring. Thank you, Chief. So we're going to wind this down. Um, I just wanted to touch base with just a few of you. If there's any key takeaways um, as we uh, you know, finish this up, and then I'm going to quickly get to a few of the questions that are in the chat. Brian, do you have any uh, additional key takeaways for today? I'd just like to echo what Chief O'Brien mentioned too, that public education does play a key role in this, especially when it's outside the hands of our inspectors and things like that. If it's in the household, making people aware of these battery fires, they, they do react similarly to gas fires, you know, almost like a propane tank. And honestly, I like to make this comparison because you don't see people storing propane tanks in their bedroom. You don't see people storing propane tanks in their kitchen. They're typically have a little bit more respect. And I feel like public education could bring lithium ion batteries to the level of people are a little bit more careful with them. All right, David from NVFC, what, uh, what key takeaways do you have today? If your department is planning and trying to get a grasp and handle this, be open to resources, vet what you're learning from, uh, make sure it's your information, don't get led down a rabbit hole by a gimmick or a poor information. And to the inspection and recycling point with our education, if we start encouraging people to go take their batteries to recycling, uh, make sure your inspectors know or whoever's responsible for that knows that, that if they're going to a, a big box like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or somewhere, and they do have a recycling point set for the batteries, it's not at the exit to the building. You know, like we see fireworks stands up at the entrance and exit of a, a big box. The, the battery recycling box probably shouldn't be there either. And and just some education on that side is, as well. Uh, very, very good point. Jim from uh, FDSOA. Sir, that, I guess one take up, a takeaway I would say is uh, we looked at public messaging is obviously very important. A lot of you gentlemen have touched on that here today. Uh, secondary to that, we focused on our reporting, right? We weren't doing a good job here locally at reporting, whether it's infers reporting or addendums to it, but we focused a lot on our investigative reporting as well as our operations reporting. Um, so we can go back and query, right? Anecdotally, I can tell you we've had 11 lithium ion fires in the last year, but we want hard facts, right? To when we go talk to our politicians, our city management, you know, our, our mayors and our elected officials, 
it's nice to be able to go back with actual details of how many of these events that we're dealing with in our respective jurisdictions. So, <clears throat> and somebody touched on it, peel back the layers. You know, we our, our local police department, they didn't realize their, it affects their impound yard when they have a Tesla that's involved in a criminal DUI. Um, evidence and property storage, the amount of cell phones that law enforcement officers confiscate, uh, and how are they storing all these damaged cell phones in their evidence room, right? So we looked across our city, and it affected our sanitation districts for our hot load fires. It affected our fleet management for all the new EVs that we're buying as city workforce. So uh, I would recommend to everybody start peeling back the layers and see how impactful lithium ion potential is in all of our uh, in our jurisdictions. All right. Now, Sean from IAFF, anything uh, you want to? Yeah, add real to quick, it? real quick, because I know we're short of time. I agree with everything, but I just want to also caution two things. Um, water is still the best agent we have. It absorbs the energy. We're trying to cool the surrounding cells. We cannot be bought in by these snake oil sales folks that want to sell us the next best remedy. Right now, our research is telling us that water is our best resource. And know your running districts. This helps you get, get you the knowledge of what you're responding to and use a conservative approach. Before you start popping doors and windows, understand that we have a condition that's very similar to a backdraft. You start to think of it from that perspective. You have a potentially explosive yeah. atmosphere. So your interaction is going to be critically important. But if you know your running district and your spider set should be tingling in certain responses. So thank you. And so real quick, Chief O'Brien, yeah. before your last thoughts, Sean, there's a question that's in the chat that's saying, what's the efficacy of an encapsulating agent additive for cooling and suppression? So we have not seen anything. We've done some research at FSRI. We've seen some marketing material or some research that's been proposed. But when you do, when you go through and look at what they're proposing or what they're presenting, the numbers just aren't adding up. We still have not seen a definitive proof that there's an agent out there that's working better than water or improves the heat absorption that water provides. Okay. And Chief O'Brien. Hey, we got a lot of work to do and everybody on this panel has been working hard to get you all resources. Check out the safety stand down page. There's everything that we could find correlate that we thought was good quality has been pushed there. So please help build, start building and don't be afraid to start small. You got some work to do. Just go to your local GM Ford Tesla dealer and say, hey, can I bring my company over so they can just see how to use this vehicle? Find the first responder guide, walk through the first responder guide. Just Action will alleviate anxiety every day. In the last little bit here, we, we haven't even scratched the surface on where batteries are in the built environment. We have more factories making batteries. We have labs. There are thousands upon thousands of buildings now in the United States that have batteries as part of the automotive process. And this isn't just a battery plant. So know that there's a lot of codes and standards out there. Both the IFC uh, 2024 covers a lot of this as well as NFPA 855. Somebody had put a question in there, what's going on? NFPA 855, which just closed for its next draft, has like 27 work groups from batteries on barges all the way to improving the storage. And so if you wanna stay engaged, NFPA is always looking for uh, people to be engaged, go get engaged. And I don't wanna steal all of Brian's thunder, but there is a lot of this discussion that's gonna take a lot of us. And if we all lift a little bit, we're gonna learn a lot. So what we know today is gonna to be different in six months. So go do something to make a positive impact because we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Right, well, thank you all. Um, I did see some questions and comments that were in the chat in regards to placarding or decals that could identify you know, some of these, uh, these areas that are important to know what we're stepping into um, as firefighters. So first of all, just remember that we have a lot of resources and tools that are gonna be at safetystanddown.org. This includes resources, training, fact sheets, and more. So in addition to the safety stand down quiz that's available to test your knowledge, um, we have 200 quiz takers that will win a limited edition safety stand down challenge coin. That is courtesy of NFPA. Thank you, Brian and your team. And then thank you to our panelists, David, Jim, Sean, Michael, and Brian for your participation. 
And thank you to the IAFC, National Volunteer Fire Council, IAFF, NFPA, and the FDSOA for your efforts to highlight this important safety uh, topic for firefighters throughout the safety stand down and, uh, and these initiatives. So remember, use the week of June 18th through the 24th to focus on the lithium ion battery response and continue to keep this important, con this important topic at the forefront of our discussions. So thanks for joining us today and stay safe. Thank you everyone.